Hello, this is Audio by Request, and this evening we shall be reading Kurt Vonnegut, Slaughterhouse-Five. Chapter 1 All this happened more or less, the war parts anyway, are pretty much true. One guy I knew really was shot in Dresden for taking a teapot that wasn't his. Another guy I knew really did threaten to have his personal enemies killed by hired gunmen after the war. And so on. I've changed all the names. I really did go back to Dresden with Guggenheim money. God love it. In 1967. It took a lot like Dayton, Ohio. More open spaces than Dayton has. There must have been tons of human bone meal on the ground. I went back there with an old war buddy, Bernard V. O'Hare, and we made friends with a cab driver who took us to the slaughterhouse where we had been locked up at night as prisoners of war. His name was Gerard Mueller. He told us that he was a prisoner of the Americans for a while. He asked us how it was. We asked how it was to live under communism. And he said it was terrible at first, because everybody had to work so hard, and because there wasn't much shelter or food or clothing. But things were much better now. He had a pleasant little apartment, and his daughter was getting an excellent education. His mother was incinerated in the Dresden firestorm. So it goes. He sent O'Hare a postcard of Christmas time, and here is what it said I wish you and your family also, as to your friend, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and I hope that we'll meet again in a world of peace, in freedom, in the taxi cab of the accident will. I like that very much. If the accident will. I hate to tell you what this little lousy little book cost me in money and anxiety and time. When I got home from the Second World War, 23 years ago, I thought it would be easy for me to write about the destruction of Dresden, since all I would have to do would be to report what I had seen. And I thought, too that it would be a masterpiece, or at least make me a lot of money, since the subject was so big. But now, not many words from Dresden came to my mind then. Not enough of them to make a book anyway. And not many words come now, either, when I have become an old fart with his memory and his Paul Malls, with his son's full groan. I think of how useless the Dresden part of my memory has been, and yet how tempting Dresden has been to write about, and I am reminded of the famous limerick, there once was a young man from Stamboul, who soliloquized thus to his tool. You took all my wealth and ruined my health, and now you won't pee, you old fool! And I'm reminded, too, of the song that goes. My name is Jan Janssen. I work in Wisconsin. I work in a lumber mill there. The people I meet when I walk down the street, they say, what's your name? And I say, my name is Jan Janssen. I work in Wisconsin. And so on to infinity. Over the years, people I've met have often asked me what I'm working on, and I've usually replied with the main thing that was a book about Dresden. I said that to Harrison Starr, the movie maker. One time he raised his eyebrows and inquired, Is it an anti-war book? Yes, I said. I guess. You know what I say to people when I hear they're writing an anti-war book? No, what, what do you say, Harrison Starr? I say... Why don't you write an anti-glacier book instead? What he meant, of course, was that there would always be wars. That they were as easy to stop as glaciers. I believe that, too. And even if wars didn't keep coming like glaciers, there would still be the plain old death. When I was somewhat younger, working on my famous Dresden book, I asked an old war buddy named Bernard V. O'Hare if I could come to see him. He was a district attorney in Pennsylvania. I was a writer on Cape Cod. We had many privates in the war, infantry scouts. We had never expected to make any money after the war, but we were doing quite well. I had the Bell Telephone Company find him for me. They're, they are wonderful that way. I have this disease late at night sometimes, involving alcohol and the phone. I get drunk, and I drive my wife away like breath on, like mustard gas and roses. And then... Speaking gravely and elegantly into the telephone, I asked the telephone operators to connect me with this friend or that one from whom I have not heard in years. I got O'Hare on the line in this way. He is short and I am tall. We were Mutt and Jeff in the war. We were captured together in the war. I told him who I was on the telephone. He had no trouble believing it. He was up. He was reading. Everybody else in the house was asleep. Listen. I said. I'm writing a book about Dresden. I'd like some help remembering stuff. I wonder if I could come down and see you. 
and we could drink and talk and remember. He was unenthusiastic. He said he couldn't remember much, he told me, though to come ahead. I think the climax of the book will be the execution of poor old Edgar Derby, I said. The irony is so great. A whole city gets burned down, and thousands and thousands of people are killed. And then this one American foot soldier is arrested in the ruins for taking a teapot. And he's given a regular trial, and then he's shot by a firing squad. Um, said O'Hare. Don't you think that's really where the climax should come? Uh, I don't know anything about it, he said. That's your trade, not mine. As a trafficker in climaxes and thrills and characterization and wonderful dialogue and suspense and confrontation, I had always outlined the Dresden story many times. The best outline I ever, I ever made, or anyway the prettiest one, was on the back of a roll of wallpaper. It was my daughter's crayons, a different color for each main character. One end of the wallpaper was the beginning of the story, and the other end was the end. And then there was all the middle part, which was the middle. The blue line met the red line and then the yellow line, and the yellow line stopped, and the character represented by the yellow line was dead, and so on. The destruction of Dresden was represented by a vertical band of orange cross hatching, and all the lines that were still alive passed through it, came out the other side. The end, where all the lines stopped, was a beet field on Elbe outside of Hall. The rain was coming down, the war in Europe had been over for a couple of weeks, we were formed in the ranks, with Russian soldiers guarding us. Englishmen, Americans, Dutchmen, Belgians, Frenchmen, Canadians, South Africans, New Zealanders, Australians, thousands of us, about to stop being prisoners of war. And on the other side of the field were thousands of Russians and Poles and Yugoslavians, and so on guarded by American soldiers. An exchange was made there in the rain. One for one, O'Hare and I climbed into the back of the American truck with a lot of others. O'Hare didn't have any souvenirs. Almost everybody else did. I had a ceremonial Luftwaffe saver, still do. The rabid little American I call Paul Lazaro is in this book and had a quart of diamonds and emerald rubies and so on. He had taken these from dead people in the cellars of Dresden. So it goes. An idiotic Englishman, who had lost all his teeth somewhere, had his souvenir in a canvas bag. The bag was resting on my insteps. He would peek into the bag every now and then, and he would roll his eyes and swivel his scrawny neck, trying to catch people looking covetously at his bag. And we would bounce the bag on the insteps. I thought this bouncing was accidental, but I was mistaken. He had to show somebody what was in the bag, and he had decided he could trust me. He caught my eye, winked, opened the bag. There was a plaster model of the Eiffel Tower in there. It was painted gold. It had a clock in it. That's a smashing thing, he said. And we were flown to a rest camp in France, where we were fed chocolate, malted milkshakes, and other rich food until we were all covered with baby fat. Then we were sent home, and I married a pretty girl who was covered with baby fat too. And we had babies. And they're all grown up now. And I am an old fart with his memory and his Paul Malls. My name is Jan Janssen. I work in Wisconsin. I work in a lumber mill there. Sometimes I try to catch up old girlfriends on the telephone late at night after my wife has gone to bed. Operator, I wonder if you could give me the number of Miss So-and-so. I think she lives in such-and-such. Such. Sorry, sir. There's no such listing. Uh, thanks, operator. Thanks just the same. And I let the dog out, or I let him in. We talk to him. I let him know I like him, and he lets me know he likes me. He doesn't mind the smell of mustard gas and roses. You're all right, Sandy, I'll say to the dog. You know that, Sandy? You're okay. Sometimes I turn on the radio and listen to the talk program from Boston or New York. I can't stand recorded music if I've been drinking a good deal. Sooner or later, I go to bed and my wife asks me what time it is. She always has to know the time. Sometimes I don't know and I say, search me. I think about my education sometimes. I went to the University of Chicago for a while after the Second World War. I was a student of the Department of Anthropology. At that time, there were teachings that there was absolutely no difference between anybody. They might be teaching that still. Another thing they taught was that nobody ridiculous 
or bad or disgusting was existing.